question what exactly does the upside down tree metaphor given in the Bhagavad Gita mean? Answer Firstly it conveys the, that there is something illusory about this world. Secondly it conveys that there is uh, a reality of which this world is a reflection. Thirdly, it gives us pointers towards how we can go from the illusion towards the reality. Let's understand this one by one. So, this metaphor comes in 15.11, 15.1 in the Bhagavad Gita. Urdva Moolam Dhaishakham Ashwatham Prahuravayam Chandam Siyasya Paranani Yastam Vedasa Vedavet and actually this metaphor goes on till the fourth verse the fifth verse is a conclusive call for action where the metaphor itself is not mentioned but the process for surrender and liberation is mentioned so in this first verse what is talked about is this upside down banyan tree urdva moolam shakam that the roots are upwards and the trees are downwards Ashwatham Prahura Uvayam and this is an imper, immortal Vanyan tree Chandam Siyasya Paranani it's quite an elaborate metaphor that right? the leaves are like the Vedas Chandam is the Chanda of the Vedas Yastam Vedasa Veda Ved and one understands this tree is the knower of the Vedas now later in 15.9 Krishna says that one who knows me is the knower of everything yoma meva sammudho janati purushottama sa sarva vid bhajati maam sarva bhavena bharata so one who knows the tree is vedavit but one who knows me is sarva vid so krishna has also earlier said that traigunya vishaya veda nistraigunyo bhava arjuna nistraigunyo go beyond the vedas because the vedas primarily talk about the karma kand that's why uh, at one level if we see it is said that the Vedic hymns in themselves are just one part of the three, the leaves. And Krishna doesn't say that one who knows the leaves knows the Vedas. Krishna says that one who knows the full tree knows the Vedas. Because just knowing the Vedic hymns will make one thing that one has to go to heavens and enjoy life over there. But understanding that one has to and one understands the whole Vedic picture and the progress, progression of, in which one ultimately goes beyond the material world that means one understands the whole tree so there is Karmakanda which is the leaves and the whole understanding the whole tree knowing that one has to be detached from it that is understanding the Jnanakanda section also the one who, so the Jnanakanda is also a part of the Vedas Upanishads come in the part of the Vedas and then ultimately the Vedas point towards Krishna as we were told in 15.15 Vedaishya Sarvai Ahame Vedyo so he is the ultimate goal of the Vedas. That's why one who knows him is Sarvavid. So now, uh, now the next verse also continues the same metaphor. Adhas Chordvam Prasruta Asta Sishakha Guna Pravruddha Vishaya Pravala Adhas Chamulani Nusantatani Karmaan Bandhini Manushya Loke So Adhas Chordvam that some of the branches, Shakha go up also and some come down also guna pravruddha vishaya pravala so guna pravruddha so what nourishes the tree is the three modes vishaya the sense objects are the twigs of these trees and adascha <coughs> moolani anusantatani some, uh, some roots go down also and then karmanu bandhi ni manushya loke and in the Manushya Loka, in the human plan, human, it can refer either to human species or in this, in this Marthya Loka, where human beings live, that here people get bound by karma. So now, firstly, the upside down indicates that there is something unnatural about this. So Prabhupada said this world is an uncomfortable place, just like if somebody hung you upside down, and you would feel uncomfortable. So this world is not a place where we can be comfortable and happy. As Krishna said, is Dukkhalayam. There is something wrong about this world. And that wrongness is that instead of being uh, uh, cooperators with Krishna, we have become competitors of Krishna. 
and that's what has made everything topsy turvy. It has made things upside down. Now, the point that the some of the branches go up and some of the branches go down indicates that actually some of the roots uh, go down also. That means that the living entity keeps moving up and down in this world, and uh, the expansion of the tree because of the modes indicates that it is the action which are under the influence of the mode that causes this tree to grow, and then. The idea that karma is what binds us. So we become more and more attached to the tree and the fruits of this tree when they, when we uh, when we do karma. When we do a particular kind of karma, we become attached to the fala that come from that kind of karma, and then we become bound thereof. Now the point of the metaphor is not to figure it out, but to get out. That's why the next verse Krishna says that Narupa Masihata Top Labyte Nantona Chadir Nachasam Pratishta Ashvatame Nam Suviru Damulam Asanga Shastra Nudrude Nachitva Tahapadam Tat Parimar Gitavyam Yasmingatan and Ibartan Tibuya Tameva Chatyam Purusham Trapadye Vatapravati Prasuta Purani. So now it says Upalabhyate means to be understood. The form of this cannot be understood. Narupamasyeha. And then it is so vast. Nantona Chadena Chasam Pratishita. Where its beginning and a foundation is very difficult to find out. Ashvaptamenam Subiru Ramulam. But it's very deep rooted. Asangasya Strena Grudhe Chitva. With detachment, one has to break it with the weapon of detachment. So now there are two different concepts. You know, this is a poetic metaphor. Uh, it is a, it is a poet. Uh, uh, so there's a lot that is concentrated in it. And rather than focusing on a technical analysis of each point by point, we need to understand the essential message that has been conveyed. Because poetry is often not uh, subjectable to technical analysis, although it can be done to some extent, but the meaning has to be more of grass, more of relished, or it has to be caught than to be sort of systematically analyzed. So the important point is there can be there is the whole tree of material existence and there is the individual attachment to this tree. So when Krishna says Asanga, now obviously detachment is not something which we can cultivate in the whole world and get everyone to get detached. So Krishna is first giving the metaphor which applies to the whole world and then he is making a call for action to the individual. So when he is saying, Drudena Chitva, break the tree. So he's, what he is talking about not breaking down the whole tree of material existence. He is talking about cutting away our own attachment to material existence. And we can't figure it out, Krishna says it clearly. So the point of that is that this is so vast and so complex. The key thing to understand is that this is a false world. That things are unnatural over here. Now, the Bhagavad Gita itself doesn't say directly that there is, this is a reflection of the spiritual reality. The word Pratibhimba or any related word like that doesn't come in the Gita. But then the Acharyas have explained it that way because that's where in our normal experience we see an upside down tree. When there is a, it is reflected say in a, a, in a river, a tree on the river bank when reflected in the river will appear to be upside down. So, but that means, this, uh, so by the inference we can say this world is like a reflection and we have to get out of the reflection. And Krishna also points about something, points to something beyond this uh, material world and he says, once you are, once you are attached, asanga shastri na dhrudhe na chitva, cut it apart and then, tataha padam tat parima gidhavyam and then when you attain the abode from which one will not fall back, yes, mingata na nivarta na tibhuya, it's come out of the screen, reach of illusion, then it's not, your journey is not over at that time. Tameva Chadyam Purusham Prapadye So after you are liberated, then attain some of that Supreme Person Ita Pravati Prasuta Purani From whom the whole world has come about So in this way what Krishna is telling is that uh, surrender to Him as a person is something which one has to do uh, after one has become liberated Of course Krishna later says also that Wherever you are just surrendered to me, Sarvadharmantati, Mame Ikam Shavadam I will protect you from the reactions. So, the, so we can surrender from whatever situation we are also. 
that also. But but the important point is surrender doesn't end in merger with the supreme because here <coughs> it is said after uh, surrender doesn't end in merger at liberation. Rather here it is said that after liberation, after one has broken on the tree, then one finds the supreme lord and one surrenders. So this is basically not so much of a bhakti mode, it is more of a jnani mode where a jnani conceives this world as a place of entanglement and becomes liberated and Krishna emphasizes that okay after liberation also what you have to do, you have to surrender to me and because the supreme lord is not known over there for the jnanis so when Krishna is talking from the jnani perspective he doesn't talk about himself in the first person he talks about him in the third person that you have to surrender to me and of course who the ultimate lord is that will be mentioned in 15.6 itself my supreme abode and attaining me. So this metaphor conveys that there is a reality that this world is unnatural, it's akin to a reflection which is indicated that it is illusory and then there is a reality beyond that world and we have to attain that reality. So the, adhash, the idea of this metaphor is to from an analytical perspective especially for the Jnanis but of course Bhaktas can also use this framework for directing their thinking and recognizing the necessity to think about Krishna. So, in this particular metaphor, <coughs> uh, the Supreme Lord is not given a direct role. I mean, this metaphor does not include the concept of any avatar. It, it is primarily talking about material nature as something from which one is to be disentangled. So, of course, that Krishna is present in this world is and he's sustaining us in this world will be talked about in the same 15th chapter later from 15.12 to 15 Krishna talks about how he's the light of the sun and the moon how he's the justifier how he is the person who nourishes the vegetables through moonlight so there's no doubt that Krishna is present in this world also but in this particular metaphor <coughs> the starting chapter section of this chapter focuses more on this world as an arena to be disentangled from and for those jnanis who want to be disentangled, uh, they gives a metaphor that okay, this is unreal, get out of here. But then he concludes by giving a bhakti message very emphatically by saying that after you are disentangled, you have to surrender to our person. So this metaphor is basically a means by which the jnanis who love profound intellectual and conceptual gymnastics are attracted to the Gita Upanishad and then through the after doing all the gymnastics they are said that okay gymnastics has culminate in prapatti in surrender to the supreme lord thank you hare krishna